Um, hi, everyone. So last year, I really wanted to come to Dinosaur JS, and I couldn't. So I drew this dinosaur, and I called it the Fomosaurus, because I had massive FOMO. And I'm happy to report that in 2017, we've pivoted, and it's now a Yeosaurus, because I'm actually here. Uh, hi. I'm not Waldorf. I on Twitter and GitHub and internet places where I get excited from a variety of things, like useful things or dumb things. Emoji is always a thing that I'm excited about. Um, I wrote this dumb bot called Two Emoji, where if you tweet at it, it responds with, it translates that thing to emoji. So if you get really bored in my talk, please start talking to my bot. It's way more interesting than me. I also really care about Polymer. So Polymer is a library for web components, and it's really because I'm excited about web components, and that's kind of what I'm going to talk to you about today. Uh, but Polymer is the thing that I work on, uh, and it's really awesome. Also, art, because this is why we're here. And I'm excited to give this talk in an art gallery, because that's kind of ridiculous. Um, but I've always drawn, I, for a while I thought I was going to be an architect. I used to draw and paint and be like, this is a thing that I should do with my life. Thankfully, that's not a thing that I did with my life, because I would have been terrible. Um, but that doesn't stop me from doing it. Now I've taken up pottery, which is a different kind of art that I'm also very terrible at. So I have all these tiny cups all around my house because I don't know how to make a big cup. You can't drink out of them. Sometimes they have holes. Pottery is awesome, strongly recommend. Because the thing is, it's kind of hard. Making pretty things that people enjoy is hard, and you have to work at it. Um, even like famous painters that you might know about, like Van Gogh, struggled their entire lives. If you read his letters to his brother, or his, uh, or his friends, he was always like, the things that I'm making are terrible, they're ugly. And like, they're not. We, want, we see them in museums, we love them. Uh, this is Benjamin Arles. He has several copies of this. He has several details of it. Like, you painted that chair like 17 times. Um, because every time he did it, he was like, well, the colors aren't quite right, the angles aren't quite right. Because art is really hard, if you, even if you're like naturally talented at it, uh, which nobody really is. So this one time, I came home. This is one of my favorite stories, because it's very unlike my mother. But it's a story about my mother, obviously. So I came home for Christmas, and she was like, Monica, I got to show you this thing that I made. And she like pulls out, and it's a painting of like a street in Paris or a sunset. I don't know what it is. And it's awesome. And the reason why the story is important is that my mother is an awesome mathematician, engineer, but she cannot draw worth shit. So the fact that she produced this amazing, awesome painting, I was like, fuck, I've been doing this for years, and you over Christmas turn out you're the next Van Gogh, great. Um, but she didn't. It was a pain by numbers. And she was like, I discovered this thing, and I think you're going to like it. Basically, somebody did all the work for you, told you what colors to use, told you where to put them, and at the end of the day, you get something awesome that looks great, and you feel good about yourself. And the reason why the story is good is because that's when I sort of realized that people really enjoy making art if you help them. You don't have to be magically talented at it. You don't have to, like, wake up one day and be like, I'm the next Van Gogh. You just want help from somebody. And it's enjoyable. You get to produce something pretty. You can put it in your bathroom. Don't put your paint by numbers in your living room. That's weird. Um, and you have a good experience doing it. And you share it with people. Because art is fun. And more importantly, sharing art is fun. We, she didn't make this thing, put it in her like, basement, never showed it to anyone. It was like one of the first things that she said. She was like, I've discovered this thing. I made it. You're going to love it. And it's true. I did. Um, and we know sharing art is fun because literally everybody in this room has taken a photo and put it on the internet for everybody else to see. There's like an entire industry from Instagram filters and Snapchat filters and Jen took like 17 Instagram photos just like in the last half an hour. Um, and we like this. We like sharing the things that we make with other people. And you know what's really good at sharing? The web is really good at sharing. Um, the web has these amazing URLs. You can just take the URL and provided it's not a garbage URL that never gets updated, you can give it to somebody else, and they can see the states that you left that piece of the web in. Um, so I want to show you a couple of apps that I really like for making art. And they're like a variety of difficulties. Uh, but they're all web-based, which is really exciting, because I love the web, and I think we should make the web better. This is, uh, is it animating? Yes. So this is Octopus Holdings. It's made by somebody from the Reeker Center. And Basically, you just keep adding words to that URL, and they represent emoji, and they keep stacking up. Um, it's called octopus holdings, because if you don't put anything good, it just puts uh, an octopus that holds a trophy. Um, but this is awesome. So I made a cat that has you know, a cake head and a lot of turtles all the way down. And I can give you this URL, and you can see it. I produced something. And I'm going to call it art. And if you don't call it art, you can come fight me afterwards, because if you make something and it's awesome, it's art. Screw you. Um, <laughs> but then you can make this. And like everything that you make is different from, from something that other people would make. 
Um, maybe you're going to have a lizard that's eating a lot of cheese. That's your prerogative. I think it's awesome. Uh, so this is an octopus holdings. The next one is by our very own Jen Schiffer. So it's Make 8-Bit Art, and it's this amazing app where you can just draw things with pixels. It's kind of like the MS Paint of our childhood. And it's really great. I drew a really crappy cat. If I spend more time, I could have drawn something really awesome. Um, and I know people enjoy making this because people will tweet at her and be like, look at all these places that I used Make 8-Bit Art with, and she'll retweet it, and it'll, and it'll be awesome. Um, the first time I gave this talk, I actually had a selfie that Jen had drawn of, of herself on Make 8-Bit Art, but then I hotlinked to it, and she deleted it and shamed me on Twitter. Um, so that was great. But this person taught their kid how to make video games and drew their sprites in Make 8-Bit Art, and that's awesome because that's what the web is there, to like help you make things and share them with people. And on a similar pixel drawing theme, my friend Juan made this thing called Megamoji, where much like with Make 8-Bit Art, you draw, but instead of drawing with colors, you draw with emoji, obviously. Um, and because another tool that we really like making, when making art is tracing. If you're not very talented, just copy somebody else's. Um, you can trace over emoji, so you can make an emoji out of an emoji, like a mega emoji. get it? So this is a cat that I made. Um, it's all made out of hearts, obviously, because cats, cats are the best. If you don't think that, again, fight me afterwards, we'll fight again. Um, <laughs> maybe tiny, but I got the fisticuffs. Um, so yeah, so that's mega emoji. It's another thing where like, everybody in this room will produce something different and will enjoy making it, and you can share it with people. And the last thing that I want to tell you about, and it sort of comes full circle, we started with, uh, we started with like, just a simple thing about emoji, then drawing, and now we're back to emoji. And this is Sam Cohen's emoji brush. It's literally a brush made out of emoji that you can draw anything you want out of. Um, and this is also awesome, and I know people enjoy using it because Ben Lesh will draw pictures of your face in emoji brush. Uh, he did this as bribery so that I would follow him on Twitter, and it worked. Um, but yeah, so this emoji brush, you can make amazing things out of it, which is great. And all of, the, all of these things have the same thing in common which is that they're better brushes for making, the web, for making art. We didn't just give people a pencil and a pa paper and we're like, go and make Monica's face out of emoji, have fun with this. We we're like, sweet, you know what, drawing is really hard, why don't you have this app that like, takes all the hard work away from you and it abstracts it out and you get to make art out of it. And it's really fun. Um, and restricting the problem is what fixed this. And if you believe me that it was easier to make art as a not very talented person because people gave you better tools, you should believe me that it's going to be easier to make apps as a non-talented person if the web also had better brushes. And I don't necessarily mean better libraries and better frameworks that do the work for you. I mean the web literally has to be better and more expressive so that you can do this. Better than divs, because if you start without a library and a framework, pretty much everything that the web gives you is a div. And to me, the div is like the pen and paper equivalent for the web, the div doesn't look like anything. If you want it to look nice, you have to know how to style it, you have to know HTML, you have to know CSS. And that's not really great for beginners, and it's not really enjoyable if all you want to do is like an awesome thing. You want people to give you better brushes. So this is what this, this talk is about, how we can give better brushes to the web. Because one of the things that the web is really good at is semantics. You've got these elements from HTML5, like header and nav and article, and they tell you what that element does. They don't look any different. They're basically just a glorified div. But you know that if you see a header, it probably is going to show up at the top. And if you see a footer, it's probably going to be at the bottom. There's nothing stopping you from being an asshole and putting a footer at the top. <laughs> Browser doesn't care. Future you is going to be like, what the shit did you do? Um, and semantics are great, because the alternative is to have a pile of divs where you hope past you put class equals header on it, because otherwise you're just looking at a soup of divs and you're like, super, don't know what this is. Semantics are awesome. Uh, oh yeah, header div, there we go. The other thing that the web is really good at is encapsulation. There's a lot of things happening in the browser that you've never had to worry about how they happen. There's all these magical elements that you can put on your page, like input and video, and you drop them in, the browser made them for you, and it doesn't matter how they're implemented. Um, there's a flag in Chrome called Enable User or Agent Style Sheets, um, where you can actually peek inside of these special elements and see what they're made out of. An input, a plain one, is just made out of a div. It's content editable. You can bang. You can mash on a keyboard with it. The moment you put like, something like type equals number on it, which has that really useless up and down number flicker, um, it already has more divs in it. And then you can start seeing them. And they have these uh, 
they have these like pseudo elements where if you've ever had to style something like input type equals range and you had to like copy paste these like 17 pseudo elements so that you can actually copy them, that's where they come from. They're like actually marked down in the element. Something like the video element is enormous and has a shit ton of DOM below it, but you've never actually had to see this. You've never looked at it because the browser encapsulates it away and for good measure says you probably don't need to know the spiders that are in here. I'm gonna just take it away, which is great. Encapsulation is really great. It takes away this like cognitive load of being like, holy crap, I should not accidentally touch this one button inside this video element because my entire app will collapse. So if we take encapsulation and semantics from the web, and then we keep waiting for the element to make better elements, surely the, ele the browser, Chrome will make emoji brush, right? I sit next to the Blink team and I keep asking them every day and they're never going to do this because you can't just add elements to the web like this. It's, you're never gonna get like Safari to agree to have an emoji brush. You can't even get them to have a date picker. Um, so you're gonna be screwed on this one for a while. But that's exactly what web components are. Web components are basically those input and video elements only instead of like being super elitist and only letting browsers make them, you regular developers can now make them. So they're much like an input element, are semantically expressive. You can call your new custom element whatever you want. Emoji brush is literally a brush of emoji. That's semantically expressive. And they're encapsulated. They're not just a pile of divs that you have to copy paste from somebody's example code. They're just emoji brush, the element. And everything that's in it, its implementation, its styles, its JavaScript are just hidden away in a little tiny box. You can peek into it if you want, but you don't have to. The point is that you don't actually have to deal with its innards. So you're gonna be like, okay, Monica, you're telling us about components. We've all heard about components. They're not special. Unlike something like a React component, web components belong to the browser. They're a new spec. All the browsers speak them when are, are trying to speak them. Firefox. Um, and that means they work everywhere where an input element would work. They can, you can use a web component in your React app, in your Angular app, in your Ember app, if you're Tom Dale. Um, <laughs> but that's not true of every other component, right? You can't just like pluck a React component and put it into an Angular app. React and Angular do not go together. Even if you download all of React and Angular together, you still don't get their components to mix, mix and match. But because web components belong to the browser and they're just a new kind of browser language, they work everywhere. And this is why I think they're really powerful. But what did they have to do with art? Well, remember, we're talking about art and we're making art with better brushes. So everybody kept making these apps and these like tr color by number things um, and, th and their art got better. And I think this, the same will happen with apps. If your components are better and better, your apps are gonna be easier to, to make um, and easier to maintain and just better in general. So didn't really want to show you like piles of code, but I do want to show you how web components go together. So I have this really dumb app that I use an exist, uh, as, as an example, and it's called Emojilate. And what it does is that you load an image in it, and then it pixelates it and replaces every pixel with an emoji, obviously. Um, and you should all try it out again if you're bored in this talk. Uh, and then tweet it at me because I love seeing whatever this thing produces. Uh, but it's all made out of web components, and it sort of like shows how they're glued together. So this is our app, this is what it looks like. And it's made out of this input type equals file at the top. It's the only way we can load files in the browser. Um, and again, input to me is the OG web component, so I'm counting it. And there's some buttons um, that you click on so that things actually happen. There's something called a paper slider, which is a web component that the Polymer team made, um, which is basically a fancy, better looking range slider because input type equals range is the worst element known to man. Um, there's a paper checkbox, which is a prettier checkbox. It has the same API as a checkbox, but it's just prettier. Um, and then in the middle, there's this enormous element called Emojilate. It's still a custom element. All of these were custom elements. And it cares about all of the things in the page. So it's in, it sits in the middle and cares about that input element. So every time the input element updates, this Emojilate element has to like redraw the entire thing because you have a new source file. This, the whole configuration thing is the slider, the checkbox, whenever they change, um, you have to redraw everything else. So this middle emojilate element cares about all these activities in sibling elements. And the way we make this really easy is with data bindings. So data bindings are new. It's this idea that I think started with Backbone, that like if a property changes somewhere, we can just propagate it magically, and we don't have to set like a whole bunch of like event listeners and stuff like that for it. There's like declarative sugar that libraries can do for you. 
And this is one of the things that Polymer can do for you because data binding, as much as we want to, does not come with a browser. We, don't, we still don't have this magical uh, mustache syntax in the browser yet, I hope. But this is why you could use the library for. So the way this works in real life, and this is genuinely code from that application, I'm not making it up, um, your emojilate element, again, sits in the middle. And it cares about two things, the file and the resolution. The file is like the thing that it has to draw, and the resolution is how many emoji you want per width. And it's gonna get that file from that input type equals file, and they're just gonna be connected with a data mining. So whenever the value property of the input updates, it goes into the emojilate. This is actually a lie, because input type equals file is also the worst element, so you actually need two lines of JavaScript to load every file. Everything that input does is the worst element ever. Um, it's great. Um, but for some elements where the, the API is actually good, like paper slider, when that value actually updates, you can just automatically update it in the emojilate. And I, I'm writing no JavaScript for this. This is Polymer is doing the heavy lifting, because again, Polymer is kind of, of a better brush for web components. Um, and this just magically works. And you can just keep adding elements, and whenever one of the properties changes, that middle element automatically updates. Until now, I've still written no JavaScript, and my element at least sort of does something. And now I have to define my custom element, because up until now, I didn't tell you how to make your custom element. And there's two parts of making a custom element. You have to make a prototype for it, a class, and then tell the browser, hey, whenever you see this tag, use this class. It's basically you're redefining a tag in the browser. So the first part, the class extension, is how you make the prototype for that element. And then the thing at the bottom I want to define is basically saying, browser, every time you see emojilate, you actually mean this particular implementation, not anything else uh, in the world. If you want to use Polymer, um, instead of extending HTML element, you would extend Polymer element. Polymer element extends HTML element with some declarative sugaring on top. It's kind of like extension turtles all the way down here, um, which is great. ES6, yay. And then another thing that Polymer gives you, which is why I really like it, is that it sort of lets you connect what your element looks like and what your element does together in a DOM module, which is kind of like a taco. So when you take a taco, you have like the shell that holds together all the goodness, the cheese and the meat and the sour cream and none of the cilantro, because cilantro is garbage, and I think it tastes like soap. As a query, raise your hand if you think cilantro is the worst. Mm, not that many of us, it's like five. Apparently it's like 24% of the population for the record, something outrageous. Um, but it basically ties all of these things together because what that ES6 class does is it just gives you JavaScript, it tells you what the element does. So if you, wanna, if you wanted to have some DOM in it, you might have to create you know, DOM in JavaScript, which really sucks in my opinion. But with Polymer, you can just put this thing called a template inside of it and it will magically glue it together. So a template is just a pile of DOM that's inactive until somebody brings it to life. And then Polymer is going to say, like, sweet, in that template is what your element looks like, and in that class definition is what your element does, and they're all together in this wonderful web component taco. Sweet, made an element. And this element is really simple. It has an image, because we have to load that image that you're giving me. It has a canvas that I'm using for, like, intermediate work. And then it has an output, which is where the emoji is going to go. And that's it. That's all it does. It's really simple. The other thing that Polymer gives you, if you wanted, um, is sort of declarative things for declarative things to like help your API. This particular element, remember, cares about a file, cares about uh, a resolution. So I can define something like a property. Um, it's going to be called resolution. It's going to be of type equals number. So it's going to type th type check them for you. So if you add one to this property, you get you know three, not twenty one. God bless JavaScript. Um, it lets you have things like observers. So whenever this property changes, you can do work in reaction to it. None of these things are hard. You could write all of this on your own, uh, much like how without jQuery you could write all the awful non-cross-platform DOM manipulations on your own. But they're here just in case you don't want to. They're just like declarative helpfuls. The observer is literally just like hijacking the setter, so whenever you set this property, you do the extra work. You could do it on your own, you just don't have to. It makes things easier. Um, and then, yeah, that, that could be your observer. Anyway, let's go back to the art. So, an emojilate is you have to pixelate it and then you have to replace the pixels with emoji. That's why it's called emojilate. I'm not very creative. And the most important part of the app was whether this emoji was going to be in a canvas or a span. And the obvious correct answer is a span because 
you want to share all your art with people. And more importantly, you want to troll all of your Slack rooms by posting this like enormous dump of emoji. And they'll be like, sweet, this is what I needed in my life. Um, so obviously, we're just not going to, we're only using the canvas for like the middle work, but we're going to output like a shit ton of spans. It's going to be great. Copy pasting is amazing. Cool. So how do we do this? We start with an image. We load it. It's going to be lemons. Um, and then you have to find its ratio. Um, because you don't want to have like skewed, a skewed output ratio. So you're going to take it, you're going to draw a canvas, and you're going to resize it by the ratio of your image. Cool. And this canvas is still, uh, this canvas is still hidden. It's like the one we're going to do for intermediate work because drawing to the screen is really hard. And then we're going to pixelate it. Pixelating an image is actually really hard because we all do it accidentally when you like take a really small image and try to print it on a big piece of paper and it looks like a potato because all your pixels are blown up. That's exactly what we're going to do here. We're going to resize that image to be really tiny and then stretch it out and paint it on the canvas and it's going to be automatically pixelated. Um, if you pixelate it, you lose a lot of the information so it's going to be easier to calculate what like the average color is and replace it with an emoji, which is our next step. We're going to chunk it out into squares and this, in this case, it's like eight squares in the width, so that means the resolution is eight. If your resolution would be 90, you would have like 90 of these tiny little squares. And then for each of the squares in your image, you're going to take the average color and replace it with an emoji of the same color. And this is where I took some enormous liberties and wrote some really shitty code, like assuming the RGB space is linear. It isn't. Assuming that, you know, if the average color is yellow, and I know that this emoji is also yellow, the closest yellow I get is correct. It isn't. Who cares? It's emoji. It's fine. Um, and then you keep doing this for the rest of your app. And then for every emoji that's like the closest to the color, you like spit it out in a span that floats really nicely. And you get a whole bunch of uh, emojis that represent lemons, which is great. And again, they're text. They're copy pasteable. So you get to paste them into Slack. And then discover that Slack is not monospace, so they're going to look all warped. But it's fine because it's lemons. And also, everybody hates you already, so it doesn't matter that they're warped. Uh, which is awesome. And the, all, the reason why this worked is, again, because I had these like, web components that were helping me. I didn't have to write all of the code to make that slider nice. I just like, took somebody else's, and it was great. Um, and we made better brushes. So Emojilate is now a better brush for the, the web, because again, it's a custom element that you can draw, drop somewhere in your application, takes a file, takes a resolution. If your file changes, you can do something with this output. Maybe you want your header images in Twitter to always be emoji. Can't blame you. You could implement something like this. And then you can go and do more of these web components that people can use in their applications. What if there was this magical word art, el word art element that was in like Microsoft 95, but using emoji instead? You have some text, and you have a background emoji and a foreground emoji, and then you write that text with emoji. Wouldn't it be awesome if it was? Again, you could put it in all of your apps and be like, enter your name here and render it as emoji. I don't know why you would want to do that. I would do that. Um, good news, there is. This is an element that my, my, my coworker made. Um, it's using this emoji picker that I wrote, because he was like, don't care how to pick the emoji, just need to do it. Um, and then he put it together, and he writes text, and it shows up in emoji, and it's great. Why wouldn't you want that? And you might think these are silly elements, because they are. You wouldn't be wrong. But there's awesome and useful elements that you could use in your applications. There's like fancy date and calendar pickers. There's like responsive layouts, all of which are web components, all of which you don't care how they're implemented. You just want to use them like you would an input element and a video element, just you know, better and with a faster update rate than 25 years. Thank you, W3C. Um, and I think that web components, if we start looking at them and if we start getting interested in working with them, they can help people build better apps. And I really care about that because I really hope these apps are going to make art. And then we can help people make art because that's fun. And why wouldn't you want to do that? And then people can share art. And we're going to make our own little galleries of internet art that we've all made. Thank you. <laughs> Dinosaur. Hi. Hi. Fancy meeting you here. Yeah. Um, we could talk. Steve, can we just talk up here for two hours about the art stuff that we made and like make comparisons and stuff? Nobody has anything else to do, right? <laughs> you don't need to eat. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. The one. Well, the first thing I wanted to say is um, you mentioned the hot linking my my selfie and, and selfie. It's a pixel portrait of me. Um, hot linking is wrong. Uh, don't so do it. Don't do it. Um, I. L 
I, I mean, most people know I love the, the parallels between um, coding and art, because as you said, like, art is hard, but as we see, art is accessible, um, just like with your mom doing the paint by numbers. Uh, and I think that tech is hard, but I think that it's getting more accessible, and I think it's sort of like a sort of cycle of, of things that I feel like when you introduce people to coding or you get people re-inspired into coding because you know, now they're like, oh, I've been building like web apps, now I have to get into performance. Somehow we have to like integrate art into that so that there's that like human connection that motivates them to like keep going. Yeah, I also think it's really important to take like the tedium away. I think one thing that turns away like beginners from coding is that there's so much tedium you have to write to get anything going, which is dumb. Like, Eventually, you're going to learn what that is, but you don't have to start with like, well, first you need to do these like 17 steps for your web app to actually run. You're like, I don't care. Yeah, I mean, I am a very visual person, obviously, and I also really like instant gratification. And so when someone's like, okay, we're going to build something, and it's like, well, first we are going to spend like 15 minutes on our ES lint file, yeah. if we're lucky, 15 yeah. minutes. Uh, <laughs> it really like sort of uh, turns me off. Um, but uh, I, I actually, I started um, doing a huge rewrite of Make 8-Bit Art with web components. Yes! But one of my concerns... No! <laughs> because as you had posted up there, there's kids using Make 8-Bit Art in school, which like I cry every time I see it, which is another great thing about making art with code, is I get the instant gratification of seeing really cool people and kids like using it, and that's why I do what I do. But the problem with... Um, Education, the whole education space is money, and money is what brings high-speed, powerful computers with updated browsers. So, like, what complications will I hit in terms of like who will who would be able to see Make Eight Bit Art? Like, what things should I do in order to make it so that people on older browsers can still use it? You should use a polyfill. So it's not even older browsers. It's Edge, for example. Edge doesn't have web components. Um, but one of the things that my team maintains and the community maintains, thank God, it would be awful, it was just us, we have polyfills for all of these things. So all of the apps that I showed you here that use web components run on IE 11 and up and like Safari 8 and up. Um, and the only reason why we gave up on IE 10 is that it's like so shitty and you can't patch constructors and it's so hard to do anything. Um, and because the spec has ES6, so first you have to like patch ES6 to work in these browsers, so everything's hard. But we maintain polyfills and we maintain like ways in which you can ship your application and like transpile it for like something like IE11 um, because we think it's very important that your apps actually run on these browsers. I think if you make an app that just runs in Chrome, it's really shitty and I will hate you for it. Um, so definitely web components work on older browsers and they will continue to work on over older browsers and we try to make them performant on older browsers um, so that everybody can use them. That's awesome. Yeah, I'm excited to, to work on it because I, I made Make 8-Bit Art when I wanted to learn how to write JavaScript many years ago and so it's all jQuery. Nice. Um, but like I, my, what I was concerned about in terms of rewriting, you know, I was like doing a lot of like um, I've done a lot of Ember and then Angular and then React and I'm doing a lot of Next.js. Let me tell you about our Lord and Savior yeah, Polymer. Of, right. Well, yeah. So I, and I did Poly, I used Polymer years ago when I first did my Vart.institute app, but it was very early on yes. and so I had a lot of like issues and so yes. now revisiting it, just like revisiting, you know, how the 8 works and all this stuff, like everything is so much better today than it was yesterday, which is a great part That's about true. the web. Um, so I'm excited to get into that and, and learn how to make something that um, still works but is more maintainable for the community because that's like another aspect that I, I yeah. like about web components is that there's a, a not much of a learning curve compared to like other things so that more people would be apt to go in and like make PRs and write issues and get an understanding of how to learn to code using that sort of application. One of the things that I like about web components is that um, there's really two different hats you can wear. You can be like a web component user and a web component author, and they're very different people. It's very easy to use web components because you don't have to know how they're built. They're just like, again, semantically expressive. They have like an API for properties you can use. So even if you're not great at JavaScript or making apps, you'll be like, sweet, I have this date picker, and it gives me a value that's a date. Amazing. I don't care how it works. On the other hand, being an element author, that's going to be much harder because you have to think about all of these users and your API. Um, so that's when the 
where the community comes in and just building these elements so that beginners can do the easy apps. Awesome. Well, thank you very much. Yay, thank you.